<laughs> okay, welcome to Year 9 Science Online with Danny Van Vieren. Hi Year 9s, welcome to another episode on botany. And today we're going to learn how the plant actually gets the water into its roots through a process of osmosis. So before further ado, let's get on with it. Okay, so previously we talked about photosynthesis and that we said all plants are producers and they are photosynthetic. It means that they can produce glucose from light and carbon dioxide and water, which is just amazing. When you think about it, a plant simply goes and sits out in the sunlight, takes something that we don't want called carbon dioxide, they add water to it, and then they produce sugar and oxygen, which we do want which is just amazing. If we could have that type of um, solar panel, <sighs> yeah, it'll be brilliant. So, you are expected to know the word equation for this, which is carbon dioxide, remember that's the stuff we breathe out, plus water in the presence of light and chlorophyll. So we need the light, we need the chlorophyll to give us glucose, and oxygen. Now, if there's not co not enough carbon dioxide, do you think this thing can happen? No, it's called a limiting factor. Just like if you don't have flour, you cannot bake a cake. So if you don't have carbon dioxide, you can have as much water and light and chlorophyll as you want. You will not go through with photosynthesis or it will slow it down tremendously if you don't have enough water, but you have a lot of carbon dioxide, it cannot work. That's like saying carbon dioxide was the flour and the water is the eggs. If you only have so much, you can only bake so many cakes and that's going to slow down or increase your rate of photosynthesis. If you don't have enough light, or if the light is weak, that's like the temperature in your oven. You won't have a lot of products formed. Okay. And then same thing with chlorophyll. But okay, so things that can change things is temperature. If the temperature goes down, if it's cold, photosynthesis will get down. So many plants in the winter time they actually throw away all the leaves and they say, It's so cold my photosynthesis won't happen at all, so I don't need the leaves. Why do I need to keep them alive? But other plants that can grow in more temperate zones, especially around the equator, um, and here in New Zealand in general, the plant simply slows their metabolism down. So when it's cold, they photosynthesis, photosynthesize slower. Okay, so temperature, the lower the temperature, the lower the rate of photosynthesis the lower the light intensity. If it's dim light, less light, the slower the photosynthesis because there's less energy. Remember, all the, the light is the origin of the energy. That's where it comes from. It's from the light. So if you're in the shadow and you need light, then you're not going to have a lot of light to produce photosynthesis. Okay, so when you look at real, real shadow plants, they have humongous leaves, which are like big light buckets that catch all the light that they can. And the more light there is, the faster the photosynthesis, until they are so full of light that they can't actually process it any further, any faster. So consequently, it will be a, um, they will be, let's call it satisfied. Okay, but the more light in general, the faster photosynthesis, and the less light, the slower the photosynthesis. And we talked about um, carbon dioxide. If there's not enough carbon dioxide, then it will also slow it down. And if there's not enough water, it will further slow it down, or in fact the plant can die if it's too dry. So I asked you guys to watch this video from the Amoeba Sisters on plants and their adaptations. So uh, I hope you did that. So from there we need to go to, if we said that a plant needs 
carbon dioxide and water. Where does the actual carbon dioxide come from? The carbon dioxide comes from the air around the plant. But how does it get into the leaf? On the bottom side of the leaf are these amazing little structures called stomata. Now, in my language, Afrikaans, the direct translation for this is a little skin mouth. <laughs> I think that's really a really cool little description. A little skin mouth. And these little skin mouths, or stomata, they can open and close. Open up to let the carbon dioxide in so that it can mix with the water and the light in photosynthesis and create the glucose and the oxygen. But um, it can also let the oxygen out because remember for plants oxygen is a byproduct. Or if it's too dry and they don't want to lose any of their water they can close. Now where does the water come from? The water comes from the roots and it's absorbed by the roots and then it travels up the stem or up the, the trunk of the tree all the way to the leaves. And this is where they then go into photosynthesis or sometimes they actually go out the leaves, out these little stomata in the form of water vapor when they evaporate. But if they evaporate there it causes a low pressure and this pulls the next set of water molecules up and as the water enters the roots, it pushes the water up and towards the leaves. Okay, and this is a process we call transpiration. Water moves through plants from the roots to the small pores, or stomata, on the underside of the leaf. This is a process called transpiration. So now, how does, how do they actually, how did the water get into the roots? Before we get to that, we need to understand a little process called diffusion. And we have talked about diffusion before. And I told you when somebody walks in with a lot of perfume, and their perfume is so strong, after a while the whole classroom will smell of it. So we know that all molecules have movement. They all move, and the harder they are, the more they move. But let's have a look at this. You can see that even these little blue particles, when we put them into this solution, they bump into each other, now they're bumping into everything and eventually they move to fill the whole space and they are equally distributed. And that's called equilibrium, equally distributed. So they go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. How many blue particles there? Very little, so that's an area of low concentration. To put it a little bit different, let's have a look at these videos. Molecules dissolved in a solution are in constant random motion due to their kinetic energy. One result of this motion is that dissolved molecules become evenly distributed throughout the solution. This tendency of molecules to spread out is an example of diffusion. But how do these molecules come to be evenly distributed? Let's start with a beaker of plain water. What will happen if we now add a lump of sugar to the water? A lump of sugar is composed of many individual sugar molecules, and even as a solid lump, the individual sugar molecules are in motion. When the lump is dropped into the water, it begins to dissolve. Individual sugar molecules move randomly and constantly from the area where they are common to the area where they are scarce. This type of motion, when molecules move from areas of their higher concentration to areas of their lower concentration, is called diffusion. Diffusion continues until all the sugar molecules become evenly dispersed throughout the beaker. The rate of diffusion is affected by temperature, size of molecules, and the steepness of the concentration gradient. Although not specifically shown in this animation, this is one of the processes whereby materials are exchanged between a cell and its environment.
this video before during our unit on matter and how diffusion then happens. Now, osmosis is the special diffusion Molecules dissolve of water. Okay, so osmosis, water moves into the plant because of a process called osmosis. Now, you guys need to remember this definition, okay? And when I ask you what is the definition of osmosis, you need to say the movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. And that happens through a selectively permeable membrane. And that in this case, it's going to be our cell membrane. Now look at these two sides of that beaker. If you have a membrane in the middle, can you see there's many more water molecules here than when, when on this side? And there's a lot of sugar, for instance, in this case, on this side. So the molecules are going to move from the area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So we'll genuinely try and make the concentration of water on each side of this membrane absolutely equal. Now, some of the water will come back, but the majority of the water is going to flow in that direction. Okay, so it wants to go into the area where there's more dissolved solutes. Now, remember, we talked about a solution, and we talked about the solvent. Vint for water, and we said that the water is the solvent, and then the all the other stuff is the solutes. So water wants to dissolve the solute until the concentration of both sides of this membrane is the same. Now, what happens in a plant? What happens in the soil? Now inside the plant, inside the cell, mem cell itself, there's a lot more dissolved sugars and, s oops, and salts and all different types of things inside the cell and this is a little root hair cell and it's inside the soil and inside the soil there's some water now the water inside the soil doesn't have a lot of stuff in it maybe here and there a nutrient and a mineral and so forth but not as much as inside the cells so if there's more stuff inside here so more solute like the sucrose in this case inside Where's the water going to go? It's going to go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a selectively permeable membrane. Okay, so that is the definition. You really need to memorize that. And again, I wrote it down here for you again. The water molecules will move through a partially or selectively permeable membrane to try and establish water equilibrium. Equilibrium means equal on both sides or the same on both sides. All right, so it's the movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a selectively permeable membrane. Now I asked you to look at the naked egg um, experiment and I really hope that some of you did it. I think it's an awesome experiment and it's easy to do at home. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed that. <coughs> so we talked about that already. So water enters a plant through the small root hairs on the plant roots. The cell membrane allows only very small particles like water to pass through. When there are more particles in the soil than in the roots, the water particles move across from the soil into the roots. The nice thing is the plant doesn't have to pump it in or anything like that. It simply has to have salts and sugars inside the cell and then the water will automatically move in because of osmosis. It's a passive process which means there's no energy. Okay, and once the water has entered the root, it needs to go up to the leaves because what happens in the leaves? Photosynthesis. And photosynthesis, remember, is carbon dioxide plus water. We need both of those. Where does the carbon dioxide come in? It comes through the stomata. But the water comes from the roots. So once the water has entered the roots, it travels up the tubes. These are like arteries and veins. We call them vessels. They're called xylem. OK. 
Okay, not fluium. Fluium are the tubes for food. Fluium for food. It's that F sound. Fluium for food. Okay, so the water goes into the root and then up the xylem to each of the cells of the plant and specifically the leaves. And when it gets to the leaves, they can actually go into the cells but turn into, evaporate into water vapor and then go out through the, remember the stomata, those little skin mouths, it can actually go out there. And what happens is because it goes out the leaves, it causes a low pressure and then it pulls up more water from the roots and the roots get more water into the roots and they push them up. So the roots are pushing and the leaves are pulling. Okay. The push from the roots together with the pull from the leaves moves the water throughout the plants. Here you go. Here's a good example. So we have water going from the soil into the cell, root hair cells, and then into the xylem. And then from, the, let me just change this to a pointer. Then right up and up and up and up in the xylem all the way up and to the leaf. And when we get to the leaf, we can turn into vapor if we wanted to, or we can go into photosynthesis. But now we're getting here, so we're turning into water vapor, and some of us go into photosynthesis, some of us then go out the stomata. And as we go out the stomata, and we use the photosynthesis, the pressure over here gets lower, and if the pressure gets lower, it's pulling more in, more and more, and if it's pulling more in over there, over here, because of the difference in concentration of water, we call that a concentration gradient, the water molecules will move into the xylem and the root will push. The roots are pushing, the leaves are pulling. Okay, so that's the lesson for today guys. Please have a look on the OLE um, for the other um, exercises you need to do for today. Thank you so much. I hope you guys are all doing really well and look after yourself. Thank you. Okay, bye.